Any any questions about lab two? How many people have got? Are you using your cell phone as a pulse uh, meter? Yeah, you can do that. Uh, it says forty-five. This can't be right. It's fairly accurate. So you're shining a light. You take. You're shining. You're you're using the uh, the LEDs that are meant to be a strobe for illuminating photographs into your finger. That's white light. So. It, it, it scatters quite considerably because, as you probably know from physics, the scattering goes as the inverse fourth power of the wavelength. So that if you, if you have a, a white light, which is predominantly, in the case of LEDs, uh, blue and yellow, it scatters probably 16 times worse than red light. And um, so you tend to get a, you don't get very good penetration into the skin. Um, yep. Anybody built? Anybody got the pulse uh, pulse meter going? Was it straightforward? Yeah. Good. Did you mess with the R's and C's? Do that. You'll find that you can optimize the amplitude and the signal to noise ratio probably by messing with the high pass time constant and the low pass time constant. And that is part of the required manipulation for this lab. So you must do it. You must try some stuff. Then um, <clears throat> how, about the, how about MATLAB interface? Anybody got that going yet? Any, any show stoppers on that that work for you? Straightforward? So 20 a second, which is plenty. Yeah. Did you have the uh, chest expansion, uh, the breathing thing on there yet? Um, we have uh, the, 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 the stretch sensors are in the lab now, in a drawer marked stretch sensor, um, in the third cabinet from the left on the shelf which is at eye level. Any other comments? Yes? So I, I noticed in your video that you posted of the, your heart rate um, that it was, it was really like spiky kind of and I, the one like the waveform I got was more like smooth I guess. Can you talk about that? So you you say you're you saying you're more mellow than I am? Is that? No, I just. I just is it so so <laughs> so so you can you're going to get a waveform that looks something like this if it is if it if it is if it looks like this then you're clipping on the bottom and you should do something about that. Probably make sure that you're not driving the circuit too hard so that, it, so that it goes, so that the output voltage goes below the cutoff voltage of the circuit. Um, but I don't think mine looked like that. No. I think it was not saturated. Uh, different people have different pressure profiles and I would guess, now I'm, I'm making this up, right, but I'm guessing that as you get older I mean, it is known that your, your, all your arteries get stiffer as you get older. So they're not as compliant. When you're young, they tend to, your arteries tend to flex like this. As you get older, they tend to get all stiff and they, they barely change diameter. And so the pressure pulses get bigger because the compliance is lower. So it wouldn't surprise me too much if I had a, 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 a sharper peak than you did. Uh, I also probably don't have quite as much dichrotic notch as you do. So you may see a waveform that looks like this with an inflection here, so-called dichrotic notch, which is, uh, I think I said once before, is a, is, a pressure, is a pressure reflection from a valve slamming shut. But if, but if there's not much compliance in the arteries, then there's not much to reflect, right? There's not much to repressurize. So I tend to not have that as much as you do, probably. But that's an interesting comparison to make, yes? So we're not saying that not, you can probably play around with 
if you're not seeing the notch, it's okay. I mean, it, might, it might mean that you just happen to have a, uh, a well-tuned cardiovascular system that's not reflecting too much energy back at the heart. So, so not everybody sees this. Most people do. But there's no such thing as a standard human. And so you, you don't... I mean, I, I can say absolutely anything about you and there'll be somebody in the room for which that's not true. Your heart's on the left side. Not mine. And actually, there are a few people. It's rather rare, but there are a few people that have heart on the right side. That's, that, is, that is rare. Uh, position of, of, of nerves in your body is quite variable. They, they're all over the place. Um, so the waveform you measure is what you measure. I mean, that's the data you have. If you can show a difference between your two lab partners, that's interesting. Uh, is there, a, for instance, a gender linkage with waveform? I have no idea. Uh, by the way, again, let me remind you that you are under no obligation to share your physiological data with the class. And if you don't feel like recording your heartbeat or, or pressure waves, you can use my finger. Uh, but, so the data you get is the data. It's the waveform that comes out of you that day with that apparatus. And that's what you're going to be using for analysis. That being said, if you have a fairly strong dichrotic notch, some, some very amplified waveform like that, then clearly if you're going to have a threshold for determining what is a pulse, you want to make sure you set the threshold here and not here, because otherwise you'll get pulse doubling. Now, your software should be able to detect that, because if you have pulse doubling, you're going to find a bimodal histogram in terms of intervals. So if we have interval on this axis and number on this axis, and you see something bimodal, better not be a heart rate because very few people's heart beats fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. Does anybody here have a heart that does that? Again, I, I, I'll say something and somebody will say mine does that. My heart sometimes skips beats and so I'll have, so it'll be, there'll be a, a distribution that looks like this where this, this will be about double that distribution. It doesn't skip many these days. It used to skip more. Not skipping today. Which I'm just as happy for, really. Skipping beats, every once in a while they skip two beats. That's long enough you say, I wonder if it's gonna, when it's going to start again. But so far it has, obviously. Um, any other questions or comments about lab two? Think about the data that comes out. Try and relate it to some biology that you know, right? And as as the as as time goes on, we can talk more about the biology. What I wanted to do now is talk more about uh, starting the rev up to lab three. So we need to talk about a couple of different things. One is physiological electrodes. How do you actually record from a animal, a human? We need to talk about noise. We need to talk about safety. And I think I'll start by talking about noise a little bit. Noise can mean lots of different things. There's uh, thermodynamic noise. Thermodynamic noise. And this could be, for our purposes, split into two pieces. One is Johnson noise. Johnson noise and shot noise. And I'll talk a little bit about those. There's thermodynamic noise. And then there's um, something which is, is not very well defined. 
I'm just going to call it component noise. And this is noise that almost every real component, transistor, op amp, resistor, whatever it is, makes, but it isn't irreducible thermal noise. It is something else. And typically has a spectrum that goes as 1 over F as 1 over frequency, and so it is known as 1 over F noise. For instance, in an op amp, you'll find that if you plot log frequency versus log noise, that there's irreducible thermodynamic noise at high frequency. But at low frequency, the noise will climb with a slope of on log log plot of minus 1, hence 1 over f noise. And every different circuit has a different explanation about why it should produce noise, but they all produce 1 over f noise. Hmm. And yes, it's a mystery. Although it, since it seems to be fairly universal, it must have some, there must be some underlying principle that is, that is independent of the details of the materials involved. Anybody, anybody heard about this? Hazard a guess about it? Could be measuring methods. There's also this idea of, of uh, Well, it's got to even be more general than magnetic because some of these materials are not magnetic at all. But let's say there's this idea of, of, of uh, uh, criticality. If you have a, a pile of sand and you drop one grain on, sooner or later the, the system will get steep enough, the, sand, the pile of grains will get steep enough that they'll start to slide. And the, the system, if, if a system is... is if energy is being added to a system slowly, maybe it arranges itself to be self-critical, that it will always be right on the edge of falling apart. So with a semiconductor, maybe you strain it just enough that if it's strained anymore, it'll change configuration and make a burst of noise. Or, or maybe you're adding electrons to some system that is just barely holding together and you add one more electron and some number of electrons falls out but you can't predict how many it's going to be just like you can't predict how much sand is going to fall off a sand pile so there's something about self criticality or something is it just for semiconductors no everything resistors everything makes one over f noise galaxies voices heartbeats and then, for our, for our purposes, what is, is often the worst noise, which isn't really noise that would be called pickup or uh, interference. And this can be, there can be any number of sources. The big one, of course, is 60 hertz line noise. But it could be uh, microphonics. which you might also call motion artifact. So almost everything you do to a circuit that involves a human changes the voltage of the circuit and causes some sort of microphonic effect. We'll talk more about that. It could be pickup from a cell phone. You say, how can that possibly happen? Cell phones running at 800 or 900 megahertz. How could you possibly even notice that in any circuit that you build? Well, all it takes is one nonlinear element someplace, like your skin. Anything that has a slight diode-like char characteristic or a slightly nonlinear IV curve, and you're going to get some down conversion from 900 megahertz down to low frequencies. And then you'll start picking that up. So any nonlinearity in the system. 
Say again. Even metal objects uh, near near the circuit, it increases the noise. He, uh, like iron, he, any iron particles. Like he, yeah. Well, he, the, metallic objects typically act as a as a capacitor to couple 60 hertz in, but they can also they can also demodulate cell phone stuff. If there's an oxide layer on the coin and you're holding it, that's going to be some sort of diode. So, to reason about this, it's, uh, it's useful to try and figure out what the relative size of these effects are. Do, we, do, we really, do I really care about thermodynamic noise? Or is that just something that is so, lo so small that it's, uh, so to speak, lost in the noise? <clears throat> so. Johnson noise is, is caused by random sloshing of electrons back and forth in a component. Since these are, there's, a, there's a gas of electrons in any conductor, or a gas of, of chloride ions if it happens to be in, in meat, but you know, let's talk about metal for right now. You have some gas and, and sometimes just by chance the gas is going to have a higher concentration at one end of the, electro, of the resistor than the other. <coughs> And you can show that the Johnson noise, which is due to this random sloshing, non-quantized sloshing, by the way, this is not a quantum effect, would be given by 4, <coughs> 4 kT times the resistance times the bandwidth to the 1 half. So this is the usual gas constant. And the resistance is in ohms, and the bandwidth is in hertz. Now, if you so, if you evaluate this at room temperature at uh, at 293 Kelvin, then the constant, and this, by the way, is the root mean square value of the it's the average value of the of the Johnson noise. Then would be about 1.27 times 10 to the minus 10 r to the 1 half b to the 1 half volts. Well, it's not much voltage, that's for sure. So let's pick a couple of typical values here. Let's say that we have a resistance of, oh, let's say just 10k ohms. That might be a kind of a high average value for a skin electrode on a human. Probably be closer to 2K ohms, but let's bump it up a little bit. And say that we want to, we want to record with a bandwidth of 100 hertz. So we're going to have a low pass filter that filters out everything above 100 hertz. Then we can plug this all in. We find that we have about 1.27 times 10 to the minus 10 times 10 squared times 10. Taking the square root of these two in the appropriate units. And so that comes out to something like 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7 volts. So it's about a tenth of a microvolt of noise caused solely by the junction resistance of the electrode against the skin. So, does that matter? It depends on how you are your measurement. That's right. It and the answer is, it depends. Yes, it can, or maybe it doesn't. Because if you're only if you're picking a few millivolts, you should be fine. But if your most sensitive measurement is going to be way less than like microvolts, then, then it matters. So. So, Johnson noise probably doesn't matter for EMG, which is what you're going to be doing in lab three, because the, the potentials at the skin are on the order of tens to hundreds of millivolts. Right? On the other hand, if you're trying to record EEG off the surface of the skull, it probably does matter. Because there, the signal is on the order of five, ten microvolts. And so now you're, you're limited, you're, you're in the region of 1 to 10 percent noise contamination. So if we, if we amplify the signal with, with the Johnson noise, 
what suppose we amplify by a factor of thousand. So will this noise be also uh, amplified by a factor of thousand? Yes. Or it has to be some. No, it'll be amplified. It's irreducible noise. You can't. This you cannot get rid of. The only way to get rid of this. The only way to minimize Johnson noise is either get rid of the resistance by making lower resistance circuits, and sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. If the resistance is dominated by the, by the meat, by the muscle, you can't lower the resistance. The other way is to lower the temperature. But you can't do that with biology very much. I mean, it's not like you can't go to 4 Kelvin and expect to see any biology. So you're really stuck at constant temperature for biology. <clears throat> what if we could factor that out for the estimated? If we could estimate the Johnson noise, can we just like compact it out? No, because it's random. And using it as a, in a differential amplifier? It doesn't help because the uh, because the resistances here are not common mode resistances, right? They're on each electrode which are independent sources. Now, averaging across trials helps. Let's say that you let's say that you have a you flash a light in somebody's eyes and this causes what's called a P300 wave. 300 milliseconds later you get some EEG signal out. And the next time and then 30 seconds later you flash again and then you record the same waveform again at the same interval after you flash, now you have extra information because you have a zero time defined, which is the flash time. Now you can average a bunch of these together and maybe get rid of some of the Johnson noise by averaging together traces which should have independent noise, but, but the same waveform if you believe that there's an underlying phenomena. That you can do. So, so then Johnson noise may matter, but, but it's right on the borderline for any of the measurements you're going to make. It probably won't ever see it in this class. What about shot noise? Now, <clears throat> and this is a quantum effect. This is caused by the fact that, the, that electron have a, electrons have a quantized charge. And so you cannot have a charge transfer, which is a fraction of an electron. That would seem to say that that uh, this is going to be more of a current effect than a voltage effect and in fact for shot noise the the current again root mean square is going to be given by two times the charge of the electron times the average current, so this is kind of like the DC current, times the bandwidth, oh, there's the old bandwidth again, to the one half. And this is a really small number for most of the, most of the uh, currents you're going to be measuring. If you had a current of 10 to the minus 12 amps, a DC current of 10 to the minus 12 amps, so one picoamp, then the shot noise at room temperature would be about 5%. So it would be about five, about 50 femtoamps. And I don't believe there's any measurement you're going to make in this class that gets close to a, a femtoamp, 10 to the minus 12 amps. I'm sorry, picoamp. It doesn't get close to picoamp. You're going to be at nanoamps or above. You're going to be a whole factor of a thousand greater, and the relative, uh, the relative noise is going to be so small you'll never notice it. So shot noise, don't worry about it. Johnson Mose, maybe shot noise, forget it in this class. If you're doing single channel recording, if you're looking at single ion channels banging open or closed using a patch electrode on a single cell, you have to worry about shot noise. 
But doing biological measurements off of humans, I would say no. How much are those currents? Are the patch <clears throat> so that would be on the order of a picoamp. Maybe less. Big channel would be a picoamp. Um, this is a general question. But what do you mean by RMS per random? So that if you measured a waveform over a function of time and quantized this at some uniform interval high enough to catch the bandwidth. So above, you sample it above the Nyquist frequency. Then take the square root of the sums of the squares of all the voltages you measure and divide by the number of points. That's the root mean square. Oh, one last thing about about 1 over F noise, aside from the fact that it goes as 1 over F, there's one other critical parameter which is given on, typically on op amp data sheets. And it's referred to as the noise corner frequency. The corner frequency. Now, since this is a 1 over F slope, if you know the corner frequency, you know the amplitude of the noise. Or you know the spectrum of the noise. So, so if you're looking at an op amp and you want to know how low a noise is it, you want to look at two parameters. One is, what is the, the high frequency noise? And the other is, what is the noise corner frequency? A good low noise amplifier here might, a really good no, low noise amplifier might be, have units of one nanovolt per square root hertz. Average noise. Which says that if you were to, if you were to have a bandwidth of 100 hertz, then you'd have about 10 nanovolts of noise coming out of the op amp for reasons that were purely thermal. All right, so that picks off these two. Now we need to talk about pickup and interference. And it turns out that the particularly 60 hertz pickup interacts nicely with safety concerns also because virtually the only safety concern you have is is electric shock from the mains. That's the high power system that's available to all of us. So helping one will help the other. So let's talk about first of all about 60 hertz pickup and our interference and that'll also lead into talk about safety. <clears throat> so what does the building look like electrically? Now most people don't, I mean you're all electrical engineers of, of one flavor or another do any of you, have any of you specialized in power engineering? Nobody does that anymore. Well, it's coming back into style, actually. It's, and, and, and I think it's coming back, Roland? Um, well, it's one power to power. I see, that's why the, the, you turned around and looked, okay. Um, so the uh, power is coming back into style because, because energy considerations are of of interest to all of us in a, in a limited world of limited resources, but uh, but but classic power engineering, where do I put the transformer, is pretty out of style. But the way this building is built is that someplace out at the building entrance, there's a building, the electrical entrance, not the human entrance. There's a room. I don't know where it is in this building. I know where it is in coarse and mud. There is a room in which there is a transformer or a set of transformers 
that takes in 15 kilovolts at the input and puts out 480 AC at the output. And these are like big wires, right? This is carrying the load for the whole building. So this might be a megawatt coming in here. Then there are some big wires that come out of the 480 transformers. And you might have <clears throat> uh, these would be distributed, say, to each hallway or maybe eight or ten places in a building like this, maybe two per floor or one per floor. Typically, if you walk along these halls, you'll notice some doors that don't have names on them. And if you were to open them, you would be in a breezeway that goes from the basement to the top of the building, and there's a, there's a raceway there with transformers in it. All right, so they're hidden, but they're there. So every so the 480 then on on every floor then gets reduced to 120 or so, which is then distributed to the to the rooms, and. At that point, then, you have what you could you sort of recognize as coming out of the socket is there's a hot side, there's a neutral side, and at the transformer, there is a physical ground. There is a physical ground that connects that transformer with the earth. And that's called ground for whatever that's worth, and that comes out next to the neutral line. <clears throat> yeah? Why does different country have different voltages? Like, back in India, it's 230 to 40. Uh, in the US, it's 100. Uh, that is purely a matter of random histor historical events. Is it, it's also 50 hertz, isn't it? Yeah. And the U.S. is 60 hertz. It's the British colonies on one of them had 230. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so it's historical randomness. The U.S. used to run at 50 hertz. My parents were alive when, when, when the electric company came around and replaced all of their clocks because they went from 60, 50 hertz to 60 hertz, and clocks are synchronous devices, so suddenly all the clocks ran 20% fast. And so they, part of the upgrade cost was replacing every clock. Now, this was in the 20s, 1920 or late 1920s, early 1930s. There weren't many electric devices in the U.S. that cared about frequency, but clocks were one of them. There was an interesting exploit at, I forget, some college, which college was it? It was a, some college, it was, a, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. Uh, the uh, <coughs> yeah, wrong class. So uh, <coughs> twenty or so years ago, there were a group of guys at this college who ran the turbines that set the frequency and the power for the college, and they liked to play cards at lunch. And so when lunch started, they'd turn the turbines down to run at fifty hertz. And so the clocks all slowed down so they could play cards longer. And then after lunch, they'd turn it up to 70 hertz for an hour and catch all the clocks back up again. So the afternoon went by extra fast. And um, this went on for a year or so until some physicist who was trying to do an experiment realized that everything went wrong right around lunchtime. They got busted. <clears throat> the, I think, I, no, I don't know. There's, there's a couple of trade-offs. One is that there is a perception that some frequencies are more dangerous than others for, for, heart, attack, for heart damage. There's also the aspect that transformers tend to become more efficient at a little higher frequency. And that's probably what it was. But I don't know for sure. Pardon me? Why not go higher? 
All right, so there's there's probably a sweet spot because at low frequencies you don't you don't get good coupling in the transformer, but high frequencies uh, iron doesn't respond to very well. So there was probably some optimization that went with the materials they had at hand in the 1920s, which did not include ferrites. So it was fairly low low uh, performance iron core transformers. So. This is not really complete yet, of course, because these are real wires. And, and so there's a series resistance here in all of these and some capacitive coupling and some inductive coupling across these two. By the way, these are connected together. Why do you run two of them? Well, the main reason is that if you detect current in the ground line, or an imbalance between the hot and the neutral, actually, if you detect an imbalance, if the current in the hot is not equal to the current in the neutral, it means that, the, that, it's, that it's going to ground, that the current is going to ground. So let's say some silly human out here grabs the hot on one side and the water faucet on the other side. I've done this, by the way. <laughs> Not, not on purpose, it was because the coffee pot, my parents' coffee pot when I was a kid had a ground fault. And there were no ground lines at the time because it was all two-wire system, right? Grab the coffee pot, touch the, uh, touch the sink, bluey! These days, what would happen is that the system would detect an imbalance in current between the hot and the neutral and, and, and pop the circuit breaker because it has what's called a ground fault interrupter in it, a GFI unit. So an imbalance between these two means that there's a current to ground and you want to turn the system off before somebody gets killed. So you'll notice that in your <clears throat> whenever there's a liquid nearby, so in the bathroom, in the kitchen, all your plugs are required in your house in new construction is required to have a ground fault interrupter on the on the circuits and the plugs that are nearest the sinks and the toilets and the and the wash stands in the bathroom. Because you want to detect that imbalance and cut the system off in milliseconds if somebody gets across it. And they're set to cut off at a fairly low value like half an amp or you know 500 milliamps or so. So it takes almost no current to, to fire the thing. Yeah? A few laptop chargers have the ground on but other few do not have to so, does, does that mean they have some better automated system inside or something? So, the, the, the rules for consumer gear, when, it has to have a, when consumer gear has to have a grounded plug or not, are complicated. If, if there is no way that a human can get to the, to the high voltage circuitry inside the device, then there, there may be a ruling that this device does not have to have a third prong. So sealed power supplies may have, may be, may be available. Yes. Doesn't the third prong also um, protect the device? It may also protect the device, but it's not required for safety. And on the other hand, if you have a power saw where you have a metal shaft coming, and ha there has to be a metal shaft coming out of the motor to connect to the saw blade. And so in principle, you could grab the saw blade, hopefully, when the system isn't running, because that's another safety issue. But you could, in principle, then, have a direct path into the motor with your hand, and that has to have a three-prong prong plug. So it depends on the device. So typically then what's going to happen is you're going to have these wires come off here to several circuits, each of which has a circuit breaker switch which responds to current and turns off. Then there's more resistance because after all every wire is a resistor. These lines break into pieces and go to each different circuit each with its own set of resistances. 
And these wires back here are rather big, and those are probably milliohms. But these might be tens of milliohms. You say, all right, so big deal, tens of milliohms. <clears throat> 10 milliohms with 10 amps going through it is now uh, a tenth of a volt. And in fact, if you go to any two plugs in this room with a voltmeter, you should do this in the lab. Go to any two plugs and touch the ground, plug, ground, so the ground pin, not the hot pin the ground pin <clears throat> on the socket, you'll find that between any two sockets, the average ground difference potential is something like a tenth of a volt. Where's the current coming from to produce that voltage? Huh? I don't know. So, you, you'd think it's just a wire with a resistor, but there's current coming from someplace. So, when you test the connectivity, you do not show shortage? Don't test connectivity. You're measuring a voltage. You're not measuring connectivity. Yes, it appears shorted. It's milliohms. But there's a voltage between them. You're measuring a voltage, not a conductance. And it gets worse than that. Because there's, oh, there's resistances every place, let's say that in the room next door, somebody has a ground fault. They have an old oscilloscope. The plug's all worn out. The uh, little hair of wire touches from hot to neutral to ground on the case, and is drawing 10 amps through the through the case of the oscilloscope. It won't blow the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is between 15 and 20 amps. It won't blow the circuit breaker, but it's producing some large current, which is flowing in their room from hot to ground going through this resistance which is in series with your room and therefore producing a voltage offset on your ground whether you like it or not and so anybody on the floor or anybody on the same transformer as you can affect the voltage on your ground system even though you don't you everything in your lab is or your hospital room is perfectly good Oh, this is so disturbing. So do all emergency rooms have their own mini transformers? Yes. Actually. So the MRI scanners, these scans they have their own separate ground. MRI scanners are immense noise sources because they are they're producing uh, between one and ten Tesla fields. These are phenomenally big magnetic fields. This is the kind of field that'll pull you across the room by your belt buckle. Whoa! Bam! Against the magnet. I mean, this, these are big fields, right? These are, these are huge fields. And because they're huge fields and because they're changing very quickly, they're inducing currents in everything. So one time I, I, I had my neck uh, scanned, MRI scanned, because I have a couple of damaged discs. And so I told the guy that I, I worked at the Coil Supercomputer and, and could I get the data set for my neck so I could visualize it. And when they pulled me out of the scanner, you know, have you ever been in an MRI scanner? It's really claustrophobic. I was like this, because it's an 18 inch hole, right? My shoulders are slightly wider than that, so like this. And you slide in, and I was beginning to hyperventilate, but you, they slide you all the way in. I was hyperventilating because I was scared. And uh, I slide you all the way, and somebody glued a happy face right there, <laughs> and that annoyed me so much that I forgot that I forgot to be scared. <laughs> happy face. <laughs> Have a nice day. So, and, and so, so, so when they pulled me out of the scanner, there's this guy standing there like this, saying, "You want to see my computer?" Heck yeah! So they took me back behind the white plastic. Right? You go in behind the white plastic. And it's a Faraday shield. The whole inside of the scanner is copper plate. This is not copper foil, folks. This is quarter inch thick copper plate. And the whole thing, the air ducts are copper. Everything is copper. There's a big door 
with fingers on it, RFI fingers, you open the door, it takes about 50 pounds of pull to open the door, you go in there and then the computers are inside, shielded from the large fields of the, of the, of the, of the magnets. So, I wouldn't be surprised if these things have their own motor generator set. The, the best isolation you can get from the, very, from the vergarities of the outside line is you have a motor hooked out here to the 480. You have a shaft, nothing like a shaft for electrical isolation, a shaft that goes over to a generator that produces the 480 over here that you run to your system. You put a big honk and flywheel on here and if there's any changes in voltage in here, the system completely ignores it because of the inertia of the flywheel. And what comes out of here is really clean power. And that's what you use to generate, to hook to a, a machine that has a lot of interference. This also protects the system from the interference generated by the machine. <clears throat> there's other ways of doing it. There are, there are transformers that are called isolation transformers. There are, there are transformers which are ferro-resonant isolation transformers that produce a constant voltage out for a variable voltage in. They make you brownout proof. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of of hospital rooms have ferro-resonant transformers in every room. Uh, slightly off topic, off topic, but in 4760, we used to have a brownout voltage setting. Uh huh. What is that? So the brownout voltage setting on a microcontroller says if the if the the nominal power supply voltage is five volts, if the brownout voltage goes below a certain threshold, reset the CPU because there's been an error. That we, there's no longer reliable operation due to low voltage. So brownout is a generic term meaning low voltage is low but not zero. And in, um, we used to have a problem in the, in the theory center in Rhodes where the voltage would change 5% depending upon the time of day and that we had a film camera. Imagine that, a film camera. Uh, it was actually a 16 millimeter movie camera that did film that was sensitive to the square of the voltage. And so a 5% change in voltage meant a 10% change in performance. And we could not calibrate the thing and keep it calibrated until we put a ferro-resonant transformer in it and then all the problems went away. It was solid after that. The commonly available, you can get these for your whole house. The voltage can be anywhere at least between 85 and 150 volts and what comes out is 120 volts really nice. So, so let's now go to one room here. So now this is kind of like at the at the building level. What the hell time is it? Well, we still have some time. So now let's go down a little bit lower level here to the room level. So we have 110 volt coming in, 120 volt coming in. We have the hot side, and the neutral side, and the ground. And now we're going over to a set of sockets, and we'll just draw this as, you know, the generic thing with a, a large prong and a small prong and a ground hole here like this. And the ground is is connected through a resistor, through the spurious resistance of the wire. There isn't a physical resistor in there, and so on. And the hot side is connected to the through a through a resistor to the the narrow slot, and then through another resistor to the narrow slot. And the new and then the neutral is connected to the wide slot. And there's, of course, capacitive coupling between everything because all these wires are laying next to each other in the same conduit. 
So everything is coupled together. There's capacitive coupling everywhere, quite considerable capacitive coupling. There are effects that whenever you turn on a device here, the voltages vary every place else because of the series resistances. So, if you have a series of plugs around a room and you expect to keep people alive, you plug everything into one socket. Because you cannot tolerate having a ground potential between two sockets that might get routed through the human. How would that happen? Well, let's say we let's say that we had a room <clears throat> This is all by way, but this is this is all by way of motivation of why I'm going to make you isolate the 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 amplifiers you're going to put on yourself. Let's say that you have a power line now coming into this is actually the ground line coming into the room. So this might be a, a room here's and and, and here's the I, standard icon for the person on the bed. Uh, so this top view, right, laying down. And over here you have a, a plug, and there's an uh, ECG machine plug, plugged in here, and this has got a ground line going down to the person's leg someplace. And then over here on the sub, other side of the room, you plug in a catheter blood pressure sensor. So this would be an indwelling catheter. You put it into a vessel. So this is hooked to the person's arm. The, and the reason there's a ground there is that there's a, a saline connection back into this device. It turns out that all you need in this case, with a good connection to the body on the outside and the catheter connection on the inside, is something like 10 microamps of current through the heart. We could, could kill them. So how big a potential do you need between these two spots to get 10 microamps? Well, it depends on the series resistances. The main series resistance here is going to be the human. You figure that the that this connection to the leg might be one kilo ohm or so, and and this connection, if it's an indwelling catheter, might be much less than a kilo ohm, but let's say one k. So e equals i r. We have 10 to the minus 5 amp times 10 to the third or so, um, 2 times 10 to the third ohms. So all it takes is about 2 times 10 to the minus 2 volts to kill you, about 20 millivolts of ground offset between those two leads. <clears throat> and so all it takes is a few milliamps of current in the in this ground line to cause enough potential difference between the grounds on opposite sides of the room to kill the person. This is the reason why you never plug them in on the same uh, opposite sides of the room. You always plug everything into the same plug module. If you go in, if you start critically looking at hospital rooms, <laughs> which you will, I mean, there's this interesting effect. The more you know about something, the more you see, right? <laughs> and if you go in, if you actually look at the way hospital rooms are laid out, there's a cluster of plugs right over the top of the bed. And there's like four or six or eight plugs right there. And that's because you want everything plugged in right there where there's no ground potential between devices. And that unit may have an isolation transformer on it also, 
but you certainly do not want any ground current flowing bef between the devices. And there's another level of protection though. Not only do you plug everything into the same spot to minimize ground currents, you break all of the ground paths to the human. Because you want multiple levels of redundancy just like you're going to have in lab three. So, you arrange the ECG machine so that this ground is broken. There is no ground. There is no ohmic connection. The circuitry that's in this device is not referenced to power line ground. This device is not referenced to power line ground. Some internal ground. <clears throat> How do you do this? Well, you can in the case of, a, of an amplifier where you don't need much power, you can opto-isolate, which is what you're going to do for the EEG, EMG. In the case of a, of, a, of a catheter or a pump or something where you need to run a motor, you would at least have a, you would have a shielded transformer between the power line and the pump. With the goal, with the goal, that whenever you hook something up, you have to do the calculation. Now, obviously, in a hospital, somebody's done the calculation for you. But as engineers building this stuff, you have to do the calculation. You have an error budget, 10 microamps, total current flow. You have to set the thing up. You have to set the hardware up so that no more than 10 microamps can flow through the human. And you're going to have to do that for lab three. Again, <clears throat> there's multiple levels of safety here. You're not recording from your heart. There's no way I'm going to let you put a catheter into your arm. Right. That would be completely impossible to do. You're going to be recording from muscle on your arm. But I want the multiple levels of safety built in because you have to learn them. Because, and also because I don't want to see anybody twitching and flopping on the floor. So if all of these devices would be battery powered, this wouldn't be a concern? That's right. <clears throat> and, and interestingly now, some, some uh, uh, IV pumps I've seen are battery powered. When they're on the human, they have a, they have a lithium ion battery in them. And they'll run for 14 hours, 24 hours off the LiPo battery. And they're not plugged in at all. That has the added advantage that you can walk with them and the, and the pump is still running. You don't have to be near a power source. So there's a portability issue, which is nice, but there's also a safety issue. So what if you design a system with two batteries in it and it's technically always running off a battery? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you switch back and forth between no, them, so it's plugged. Right. That if you could uh, in all these things, if you if you have a plug on on one side and it's hooked to the patient on the other side, then it's up to you to show the FDA that it can never fail. Right. So all devices have to be approved by the FDA or by an equivalent licensing agency, and if you can show that it that it's safe enough, then sure. So it's always battery powered. It just happens to be plugged in, but you have two sets of batteries and a really, really safe relay between them. Now, there's other things you do too. <clears throat> there's so you got this this poor person laying in bed here, all wired up. And of course the lights are on overhead, right? So you have you have you have EM, you have large electric fields in the room. ECG has to filter that stuff out either by common mode rejection, or by shielding the lights, or both. And in most most places, the lights will be shielded. These lights actually have a screen over them. This is an aluminum diffuser, but it's not grounded. It could be, and in a hospital it would be. And that would cut down the electric field quite a lot to have the screen grounded in front of the, in front of the uh, light. 
in the buildings where we did electrophysiology, they just installed dumb old fluorescent lights. And so what we did was to pop the covers off and slide chicken wire into it and then pop it back together and put an alligator clip from the chicken wire to the or the hardware cloth from the screen cloth to the to the ground line and that fixed it <clears throat> looked terrible but okay now there's another possibility and that is you could change lights uh, fluorescent lights are low power they're they're they produce a nice white light, which is good in an operating kind of environment where you have to do small precision motions. But they're extended sources and they're capacitive devices, so they capacitively couple very well. Old fashioned incandescent lights are much lower noise, as are LEDs. So if you either go back to incandescence, halogen lights which give you that nice bright white operational light or you go to LEDs, you'll have lower noise. If you insist on fluorescence, there are conductive coatings. ITO, let's see, what is ITO? Indium tin oxide, right. Indium tin oxide is a very good conductor which happens to be transparent. And so you can coat a, 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 a light with ITO, ground that, you won't see a screen, you won't cut out the light flow, you'll get the high efficiency, but it'll also shield it against, uh, against radiation. Another thing you can do to help cut down electric field around the human, well, ideally, you all know what a Faraday box is, right? If you, if you have a closed, perfect conductor, a closed box which is a perfect conductor, then there's no electric field inside. There's no electric field could penetrate that. All the field lines run around it. Now, that's fairly impractical to put a human in. When you're doing physiology, if you're working on a small physiological system, you can build a Faraday cage or a Faraday box which is made out of screen and might be this big and you put your microscope in it and by the way if you look down in the lab next to 238, 236 I think it's on the same side of the hall it's the one where Dick Sheely has all of these big microscopes you'll notice each one of them is inside of an aluminum case which is the Faraday cage so you close that baby and all the electric fields are screened out from the circuitry inside So how much of a box do you have to have before it matters? If you open the front, is it still useful? Let's say you have, instead of six sides, you got five sides. Well, it is still useful because the only way for an electric field now to get in is to loop in the front and back out again. And that just becomes unlikely as this aperture gets smaller and smaller. So having an open front doesn't matter that much, in fact. But that's impractical for a human too. But what you are, well, but what is pretty practical is that the human side view now, top view side, yeah. Anyway, so you have the human on a grounded plane. That acts as a Faraday box with one side, and it'll tend to short the fields down and cut off some of the field strength of the human and, and partially shield you. And you'll find in the lab that the circuit you build will have lower noise if you build them on an aluminum sheet. So if you take your whiteboard, if you're having 60 hertz noise with a whiteboard, and you just put the thing on top of an aluminum sheet and put an alligator clip to ground the aluminum sheet, you may find that the system becomes much more, much quieter in terms of 60 hertz noise. So Making the circuit on the ESD board would you say anything? Yes. Yeah. Alright, so all this is kind of now warm up for the lab.
So in any reasonable experimental environment or a, or a hospital environment, you're going to want to screen lights. You minimize inductive loops. Hmm. You, we, most of you are, are more used to thinking about static electric fields than magnetic coupling, but there is magnetic coupling whenever you have a loop of current. So you want to cut down the loops of current. You don't want to have wires dangling around. You want them all next to each other. So for a differential input, if you have a differential input amplifier, and one side is dangling off your leg, and the other side is on your arm. Again, we have here the standard human being, right? <clears throat> and these wires are far apart. Then in principle, you two, there's two possibilities. One is, this wire is in a different electric field environment than this wire. And so there's a different voltage coupled into it capacitatively. Also, if these wires are far apart, you can loop and let a magnetic field through there and a magnetic field through a loop of wire makes a voltage. So that says that on a differential amplifier, you want to keep the input leads close together. How do you do that? Well, that's why they're often twisted together. So if you twist them together, if you take the two wires and twist them together as far as possible, that does a couple of things. One is, it guarantees that they go through the same path in space because they're wrapped around each other, right? And so the electric fields tend to cancel out. Secondly, because they're wrapped around each other, there's no cross-sectional area between them, and so there's no magnetic field interference. So you can often cut down the interference on a differential pair by making sure the leads are twisted together. And of course you want to isolate or break all of the possible ground paths both for safety and also to get rid of ground currents which could result in noise. And then at the last thing you do is to use differential recording to get rid of the last bit of the noise. Yes, you can, you can have a notch filter. So if you know that the frequency is exactly 60 hertz, <coughs> then you can build a filter. If you have well-matched components, that is to say capacitors are well-matched, resistors that are well-matched, you can build a filter that has a characteristic that looks like this at 60 hertz versus amplitude. There's two problems with this, three problems really. One is, it's hard to get this notch very deep because it requires precision matching of the components if you do it analog. But, people build digital filters in a box. They build single integrated circuit digital filters that filter at exactly 60 hertz. Secondly, any sharp filter, any sharp filter rings. So if you put a pulse on this filter, boink, narrow pulse, it will ring at 60 hertz. Because there's a phase shift across this cutoff, which, is, which goes through 180 degrees and causes, um, causes ringing. Positive feedback becomes negative feedback becomes positive feedback. And lastly, if you make this notch very narrow, then you have the problem that the actual frequency of the sine wave coming into your apparatus is only guaranteed to be 60 plus or minus 0 0.3, I believe. Does anybody know the actual spec on that? I think it's 0.3. I think it's allowed to be 59.7 to 60.3 hertz. So if only 10 microamperes might, or is it might kill a man or will kill a man? Depends. Probably wouldn't do anything to you. But if you've got this 86 year old who has a weak heart, who is on the verge of a heart attack, might well kill him. 
Okay, then let's say order higher will definitely do it for me. Probably a milliamp. Yes, probably. Yes. Then why do they have such high voltage and currents on an electric chair? You're talking about yeah, a lethal a device that's meant to be lethal. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's because you really want to cook them. I mean, those are those are those are power devices. They're not stopping hearts. They're frying people with those with an electric chair. I I, I don't want to talk anymore. I bet it's just repulsive. I mean, I, 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 very upsetting. So. Let's say you've tuned your notch filter now to 60 and the frequency is actually 60.2. If the notch to the degree to which the notch filter is good, it misses the frequency. Oh, then why not have an adaptive filter? Okay, if you cut out a band, now you're losing information which may be relevant to your recording. If you're doing EEG, that 60 hertz is still an EEG band. Top of the EEG band. It's uh, there's stuff up there, and also, also remember that any transient counts as a high frequency. So, you may be able to just filter at 60. <coughs> but what a lot of people do is to use an adaptive filter that tracks the input. So you use a, a, a filter with two inputs. It has your signal in and it has the reference noise in. So you hook it directly to the 110 volt line, you get a scale version of the 110 volt signal, and you subtract that from the, from, the fill, from the signal of interest. You subtract that and all of its harmonics. And you can get the noise down by 20 or 30 dBs. Factor of 100, 150. And that's called an adaptive filter or a least mean squares filter and people use that in neurobiology, there's a device called a humbug, which uh, which does exactly that. It, it it gets the the reference 110 volt line, subtracts it out of your signal, and only costs eleven hundred dollars a channel. Two students in in 4760 built one that was almost as good for thirty dollars. Uh, it's possible to do it fairly easily with a microcontroller. Do active canceling of, of noise. And I believe now that most EEG units do active cancellation up to maybe the fifth harmonic. The harmonic distortion, oh by the way, what comes out of the power line is not a pure sine wave. The, the, the harmonic distortion is allowed to be as high as several percent, which means that you can uh, get significant squareness to it. So next time we'll talk about what you're actually going to build. Unlike lab two, for lab three, I'm not going to give you a circuit. You're going to have to deduce the circuit by reading the data sheets. I'm going to give you a block diagram of what I expect, but you're going to have to read these data sheets in some detail to figure out how to build this thing. It's an interesting exercise. I'll help you. Okay. <laughs>